This is our eighth video in the Computer Aided Archaeology course. And last time we talked about how you can do a statistical test and what a statistical test is all about. And this time we will totally switch gears and concentrate on another aspect that is very important in archaeological studies and that is the spatial dimension because archaeology is also a very spatial um, or spatial oriented science and so there is the need <coughs> to be able to produce maps and to visualize spatial processes on maps and that's what a GIS is for and uh, we will learn this time how we can do basic mapping but we will start with what actually is a GIS and what kind of maps are there and some basic information about the specifics of doing mapping of a uh, three-dimensional object that's the Earth's and the Earth's surface on a two-dimensional um, representation a piece of paper or a, a computer screen so why do we create maps and that's what I kind of already talked about we need maps to visualize spatial processes and a lot of things in the past I mean all the things in the past took place in space and most of the time we are talking about um, processes that takes place in four dimensions so that's space and time uh, but since we are not so much um, there's not so much the need for us to visualize the third dimension often because humans are uh, fixed to the earth surface at least in prehistory um, we have at least two dimensions and the third dimension comes in as an extra information that is not, s not necessarily represented in, um, in, s in a space which makes it for us easier to find representations of objects in a way how we can represent them in the way to which we are limited due to our publication um, possibilities and that's two dimensions on a sheet of paper or on a computer screen and um, we want to visualize different things and that's why we also need to talk about different types of maps and um, what you probably are already very familiar with are general reference maps that's um, maps that show important features physical features of an area mountains lakes rivers and like that most of the time we're talking about natural features but if we look at general reference maps on uh, today's environment also man-made features are included in these kind of maps streets or buildings usually they are help to be able to navigate or discover locations in space if you are out in the wild and you are looking for something specific and usually they're fairly simple and easy to understand. They can be styled based on the intended audience. For example, if you want to have a tourist map, you probably would like to highlight tourist attractions, while locals probably want to have more information about the local um, institutions um, and where they need to head for, for example, by reasons or where you can buy stuff. And <coughs> this is one example of such a general reference maps that you're probably know already if not I highly recommend using this kind of uh, Schweiz mobile uh, maps for plan of hiking and stuff like that and you can see here that we have man-made features in terms of streets but also in terms of, of uh, cities but we also have the representation of the natural environment by lakes rivers or mountains but beyond that, uh, if we want to have a specific topic that we want to locate or visualize in, their s in its spatial extent or um, location, we quite often use thematic maps that helps us to highlight information that are not directly associated with a physical um, structure or um, features of our landscape. For example, uh, if we want to give some 
the distribution of some phenomena. If we want to show that, we can use thematic maps and I will show you some small examples. For that there will be a bit more um, in-depth review also in the second part of the video that we will see next week. So thematic maps focus on a specific theme or subject area beside the fact that they most of the time focus on specific areas in a spatial sense. They are used to highlight and <coughs> represent topics. Features on the maps represent the phenomenon that is mapped. Maybe there is a background of the natural environment, but we want to map something specific in respect of the topic that we want to have spatially represented. And the spatial features of the environment are used for reference, for example, the rivers or on a larger scale, for example, the, um, the oceans, uh, so that we have an idea where we are uh, in space. Also, mountains can serve this feature. Here is a one specific archaeological, very relevant kind of thematic map, and that's a distribution map where we can see the distribution of different fibula types in space in combination with the natural uh, features that helps us to identify where uh, these objects are located. And you can see that we have some um, specific signatures here for different um, types of fibulas and they can be understand if we look at the map. Now if we see these different symbols we know where a specific type of fibula is distributed. These kind of maps are very very common in archaeological literature. If we so in that case <coughs> we uh, we will see the individual occurrence of individual objects here. If we have um, a more abstract perspective we can also for example map archaeological cultural phenomena uh, like here different Neolithic cultures and this time we are not seeing individual objects but we see something that has already an abstraction level. We define cultural units for a good or a bad reason and then we can draw their extent on a map using um, two-dimensional representations, so polygons or kind of blobs here and we use different colors to specify what kind of um, archaeological feature is meant here or culture in that case and we can identify uh, what is specifically meant by the legend here that gives a specific color coding to individual phenomena here and the extent of these objects very much depends on how we how well we defined the object in the first place and um, so it is, is just a spatial representation of um, something that is not necessarily defined in space but having that mapped gives us an additional possibility to understand um, the the object in their spatial um, representation and helps us there to get another view of the phenomena that we are look on. And you can replace this cultural concept here by different other things, for example the extent of uh, different economic systems or the extent of let's say languages if we are not talking about archaeology. So the general idea is the same although you can replace the content by some other higher abstract level phenomena that we would like to represent here. Not the individual object but something that's more abstract. And if we go even beyond that we can also for example map and show the distribution of different um, ratios of objects or things or uh, phenomena in space. So we have another dimension of representation here. In that case we can see the genomic distribution of different haplotypes in space and we can easily identify that here in the eastern part of this map we can see um, a representation of this specific haplotype dominating while here we see uh, another 
haplotype is dominating. So this gives us another more detailed version of what we have seen with just having some colored blobs on the map. Here we have more information about the specific um, con uh, constellations on site making the map more difficult to read and to understand, but at the same time give us a more detailed view. And you can easily extend that. Um, the same is true here like uh, for the general visualization. The more information you would like to represent on a map, the more difficult it is, it is for the reader, so you should focus on using as much um, complexity as necessary to transmit your message while at the same time keep it as simple as possible to help the reader to really dif be able to differentiate between important and not so important information here. Okay, what are basic elements that we can see all over different maps beside the physical background that is usually represented as some kind of image here? And most of the time we talk about different uh, representations in respect of the things that we would like to re represent and their uh, abstractedness or their um, yeah, complexity. Mm. And probably also in respect to their actual spatial extent. The most simple one is a point. So for a point we have x and y coordinates for an individual object phenomenon that we would like to represent here. And um, there can be a z-axis, that is the height, but most of the time in the GIS we probably will represent objects in x and y coordinates and the height is something that's additional to that, that can be uh, not represented in a two-dimensional way, but um, that can be an added information that can also be visualized via, for example, color coding or other things. The next type, if we connect different objects here that are also uh, meaningfully connected, um, we get a line here. If we have different points in space and we connect them, we can get a line. And for these lines, there are multiple points that um, represent the, the um, distribution or the extent of the line or the, the path that the line will take. Um, for example, streets or other things that are linear or curved, but that they represent not really uh, an area, but a linear object, so to say. The next thing that we have are polygons, which represents spatial extent, and they can be regular like this one here, or irregular like that one here. Again, we have individual points that represent the, the anchors um, of the extent and we can connect that and usually a polygon means that there is a spatial phenomenon taking place like we have seen in the example with the cultures and their mapping. Um, so this is another way or another um, object that might be represented on maps that has not only a uh, one-dimensional extent but a two-dimensional extent in area that needs to be represented here. And these are the, the main things, main objects that we will see on maps. There are additionally multi-lines which are several lines that are connected via a, a common um, topic while at the same time represents only linear structures and you can have multi polygons when you have distributed areas that are not directly connected in space but are connected in respect of what they represent um, but essentially this is just an extension of the simple line and the simple polygon um, feature that you might have and all the time the point is the essential um, representation or the, the basic unit of these kind of features and if multiple points are connected they can form a line or a polygon and to be able to represent these objects we need to have the coordinates of the individual points here and an additional information that these points for example are connected. 
how can we now <coughs> make maps and represent our objects and the background information for example the spatial um, extent or location of natural objects in a map and how we can practically do that of course we can take a pencil and draw our maps on a sheet of paper but most of the time um, probably this is not accurate enough <coughs> and also at least me I am not uh, as gifted in in artistically creating maps so there are some tools that help you to come up with decent looking maps and uh, tools that uh, enable you to draw maps in a fast way because we are archaeologists we are scientists we want to concentrate on representing information and whatever tool helps us to make that more streamlined is very welcome in our subject and the main here computer come uh, can become handy and the main um, tool on the computer area is the GIS or the geographical information system which is according to Wikipedia a system that is designed to capture store manipulate analyze manage or present spatial or geographic data or more simple in your JS you can connect data with geography to come up with a representation of your data in space and these data can be very different uh, you can have data on streets and then you will have a street network as one object you have probably another uh, sheet of excel sheet or whatever of building data and you can then combine that in a geographic space um, either as polygons or as individual points you can have some vegetation data that are probably uh, more continuous over the landscape and if you integrate all of them in with different layers you get a map with all the information that's necessary to represent to transfer your message to the user and GIS are designed to handle this process or to, to facilitate this process in um, getting the spatial extent of objects representing these objects and combining different layers of information here so GIS is used to create interactive queries for example you can search for some spatial information in a JS to analyze spatial information using different stati spatial statistical uh, methods to edit data and maps so if you for example want to need to move a point to some where else you can do that in a JS to change the coordinates of an object and to present the results of all these operations in a map in an actual map that you can include in your thesis or in your presentations and present the, the data in a nice looking and informative way to the user most of the JS systems have some common elements that are here represented in uh, JS that we will not use but um, the essential functions are the same so we have quite usually a menu uh, like we have with kind of all software and a toolbar where different tools uh, can be um, located and we can have additional tools in uh, another toolbar or tool palette that uh, hoovers beside that or wherever it is is located so quite often you have some main tools in a top bar and then specific tools in a sidebar so then we have our actual map in the most of the time the most dominant window here that shows the result of our operation in a map view and beside that most of the time we will have some layer views where we see the different layers that are represented here in the map and most of the time the order of this layer views this layers here in the view uh, also represents the order of the individual layers on the map I go shortly back so the basic philosophy here most of the time is that um, or um, metaphor is that we have some different transparent sheets with different objects and we lay them 
on top of each other. So the layer that's topmost will cover layer that are below that. And with this, you can also specify what information are in the foreground and what informations are in the background, literally, but also semantically. Okay, and the last object that is represented here is called attribute view here. And this is most of the time a table that gives you the information of uh, the objects in a specific layer that are not represented necessarily in the map, but which are also there and can, pro for example, also be uh, derived from the spatial representation of objects. So in that case here, we see uh, the land use here as uh, attributes and we can see different rows that represents different polygons here in the map and here we have different attributes that are not visible in the map per se so the area the parameter probably some object id um, and representation of what kind of um, feature we have here this is this time actually represented in the map by different colors and then year of change and other attributes that are not necessarily mapped now, but th which are available to be mapped and represented in a spatial way. So with a JS, you can view data and explore data to see, for example, patterns and also visualize these patterns. Um, you can create and extend already existing data sets uh, for example with digitizing we will do that later on you can edit and existing data sets so you can move um, coordinates or you can change attributes that are part of a spatial object or a spatial feature you can combine different data sets um, from different sources like we have seen with the different layers you can we can transform spatial informations to different coordinate systems. What that means we will see later. You can also transform from raster representation to vector representation. We also see what is what is, uh, this is what this means later on. And do other operations that uh, represents transformation of the original data representation into something else. You can also query, for example, see what objects are in the vicinity of which other objects we can analyze so deriving new information from uh, existing data sets and transfer that into new data sets and finally we can create nice looking maps that we can include in our scientific work so that's what a GIS is for and last time I was asked uh, for for a statistical method is this relevant for me? GIS is definitely relevant because uh, this might be part of your job or maybe is the major part of your job later on. Cantonal archaeology is always very interested in people that are experts in GIS. So here is um, a very recent um, job advertisement for these kind of things. So GIS will, you will be confronted with using GIS in your professional career in different ways and it can also be your main object of um, yeah the main object of your work uh, later on and it's also uh, sought experts and quite well paid we will use here in the course QJS which is free and open source software you can download it here and you probably have done that already in for the course um, if you don't have it or installed, please install it now for um, this lecture and the practical part that we uh, do with that. QJS, there are other JSs out there. Uh, one major player is ArcGIS, which is a commercial JS that is quite often used in, um, for example, also the cantonal archaeology, but also in other, um, yeah, let's say uh, official um, institutions. QJS is a very good replacement for that. It has, as you see, similar elements like we have seen before in the other GIS system. 
and the benefit here is that um, you are not forced to install a very ex uh, expensive software but still what you learn with QJS you can easily transfer if it's later necessary to use um, ArcGIS for example the workflows are essentially the same probably the tools are called named differently and probably they are located at different locations in uh, the window but the essential um, philosophy is the same like with all or most of the major JS systems out there so I think it's a good way to start that um, and also um, it enables you to get familiar with open source software so the actual process of producing a map is most of the time that we have some base map which most of the time are some kind of raster data so basically an image uh, which represents the geographic features the, the natural features of the environment and then you add to this base map different layers that represents different um, data that you would like to to really map and show their location in space <coughs> and um, I've already opened up this distinction between raster and vector data when we talked about this different features of maps we talked about vector features that are represented by coordinates so you can have points you can have lines and you can have polygons on the other hand we have raster data that are essentially images you can always um, so here in the lower area you see the real world representation of what you would probably would like to map and you can see how this is stored in raster and vector formats in vector formats you can um, you will have the coordinates of the corner points for example or the path of the uh, this this line feature here while in raster you will have raster cells of a specific width um, that co um, is can be transferred or um, um, thought of having a specific extent in the real world uh, and it's like every other raster information when you zoom in the pixel becomes or the, the image becomes pixelated and um, the um, resolution is reduced of what you see while in vector data you can zoom in as far as, as you like and it wa will always be a crisp image of the, the feature that you will see there you can always transform a vector image into a raster image by specifying on which resolution you would like to have the uh, objects in the vector view um, represented the other way around is more difficult because here we have specific coordinates <coughs> if we have a raster representation we have an extent and we don't know which specific point is meant here or in, in this uh, line situation uh, how the actual um, line um, or the actual <coughs> extent and direction of the lines where and so uh, when you transform f something from raster to vector you will not get um, more precise information here while the other way around it's you don't lose any information from vector from raster to vector you will lose some information here okay starting with raster <coughs> what are there um, so rasters are esse the essential is essentially an image like I've already said but this image is georeferenced and there are different ways how this is achieved it depends on the specific raster file format that you're using most of the time they're used as background maps but they can also contain continuous spatial information like altitude precipitation site density and what have you so whatever is continuous over the whole area and not <coughs> represents individual features in the area this is a use case for raster images there are multiple formats available image uh, from S3 grid and TIFF these TIFF files you probably know the, these as uh, general image files there is a specific variant of that that's called GeoTIFF and that's the quasi standard for raster images and a raster image can look like that so this is the altitude of I don't know where actually but you can see the um, the brighter the color is the whiter it is 
the higher the altitude is here, the darker it is, that's a representation of lower altitudes. And this is a spatial continuous representation of the altitudes, which is pixelated. So if we would zoom in, we would see individual pixels here. Um, but since it is extended over our whole uh, working area, it makes sense to have these as raster representations. On the other hand, we have vector informations and there are different standards also for that. We will here work with shape files um, because it is still the, the standard way of how vector informations are stored, although it's a quite old and complicated file system. So it's a basic file um, structure for storing map elements. <laughs> it stores spatial data like points, lines, and polygons. Um, the downside is that a shape file is consisted of multiple individual files. You will see soon uh, what kind of files there are here. <laughs> so the standard um, is you have a shape file or I will go through this in detail in the next slide. So standard, maze, standard you have a shape file, which is the main file that stores the features geometry. And that's this one here with SHP uh, as, as extension. And so this is just for the geometry, while the DBF file, that's a DBase and very old database format table that stores the attribute information of the feature. So we have seen this kind of attribute information before. It can be an ID, it can be um, uh, derived information, but it can also be specific information that gives meaning to the individual ge geographic uh, features that are represented with the geometry here. Then we have a PIJ file. <coughs> which stores the coordinate system information on which kind of coordinate system are the, the values taken, what are the, the, the coordinates, or how to interpret the coordinates of the actual shapefile. And that's this file here. <coughs> and you can have also an SHX file, which stores some indices that makes it easier or faster to uh, use this feature geometry. But <coughs> this is not strictly necessary. The most relevant ones are the DBF, the projection, and the actual geographic or uh, geometric information in the shapefile itself. You might also see CPG connected to a shapefile. This uh, identifies the character set to be used. We have already talked about different character sets, UTF-8 and uh, Windows 12, 5, 6 and other ways how to translate bit um, patterns into actual characters like letters. You can also have more spatial index files of the features that can uh, have these kind of uh, extensions here. Um, but at least these three, most of the time these four files here, that these essential files, they make the shape file. They are all connected and you need to have all of these files present. For example, if you want to give someone else these informations, you have to ship all these individual files in one go, probably compress them into, a, into, an, uh, into an archive, but you have to always use all of these fours. You should not separate them, they should always be in a specific layer. So shapefiles have s uh, some limitations. You can only represent one geometry type in a shapefile. You can have a point shapefile, a line shapefile, or a polygon shapefile. You cannot mix points and lines or points and polygons in one shapefile, which can, up can end up with structures like this, where you have uh, lines here, the points and the polygons, which are all part of a specific map and also all part probably of the same data set, but uh, which are need to be represented here in different, um, yeah, in, in three different shape files, which then themselves consists of four different files on your computer system. And with that, your uh, folders can soon or very fast be filled with different files um, which is definitely a downside. You have to have a good way to organize this. 
Okay, but still, shapefiles are still the, the, the basic standard of how uh, vector informations from geographic um, information systems are stored, and so we will work with them. Um, we'll probably talk in the practical part also about more advanced or evolving file systems or um, formats that uh, are on the way of replacing shapefiles in the near future. Why is this all so complicated? Um, because we are talking about coordinates and uh, coordinates take place in a on a three-dimensional object here because the Earth is a, is a, uh, a ball or whatever Kugel means in English um, and so we have to have an, a way to represent the position on this um, on this shaped three-dimensional object um, and for that we need to have some coordinates and you are probably most familiar with this latitude longitude system where we have degrees um, and uh, probably also um, more specific smaller units which are minutes and seconds like with, uh, we have with time and these represents angles in respect to uh, the equator which is here in the middle in the center of the earth um, um, defined as zero according to the rotation axis of the earth and uh, for the horizontal coordinates we have an arbitrary chosen zero at Greenwich uh, near London so this goes from pole to pole through Greenwich and from here it starts with zero and we have then uh, coordinates to the east or to the west and I'm pretty sure that you are aware of this kind of coordinate systems um, the problem with this coordinate system is that constant angular deviation for example from 0 to 20 degrees do not have this a constant uh, deviation in respect of distance so one degree of longitude at the equator here is not the same as near the poles because as you can see here with the, the different lines the nearer to the pole we get the smaller the actual distance between um, these angular uh, coordinates are. So it's still a basic coordinate reference system. We can find most of the objects on the Earth using this this very simple coordinate system, but it's unprecise in respect of the actual uh, shape of the Earth and it has this annoying feature that things are not uh, has have not the same length if they have the same uh, deviation in degrees. So to overcome this there are different coordinate reference systems um, that try to uh, make a compromise and give you the information on meter based so that uh, we are know that if some values have an equal difference that this means also the same distance in real world and the basic problem here is that we talk about a three-dimensional round object the earth that has to be flattened in a way that we can represent that in two-dimensional coordinates and also represent that in two-dimensional representations. Projections are no one's favorite part of a GIS or of geographic informations in general because they can be quite complicated and messy, but it's a necessary part because we have to understand what kind of coordinates we have and how they can be used in order to be able to really meaningfully map data. Um, so projections are used to convert the three-dimensional Earth, latitude and longitude to X and Y coordinates on a two-dimensional map. And there are of course different ways here. There is no perfect way because however you peel the orange uh, there will always be some, um, some uh, remaining curvature and uh, the more precise you want to have your map, the more detailed it is, the more this remaining curvature uh, matters. If we have uh, the total Earth here represented, 
uh, we probably can ignore that there's still a curvature in the real world but if we zoom in this probably makes quite a huge difference um, so coordinate systems are used because features on spherical objects are not easy to measure um, so that's why we use meter based things and features of planes are e much more easy to measure and also to represent because uh, here we can calculate the distance, the angle and the area. And these coordinate systems provide a measurement framework, most of the time meter based, to be able to do these calculations and for example also come up with spatial statistics here. Here's another representation of the problem. Um, if we want to represent um, the three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional plane, we have to make compromises either in the way how we shape or also in the way how we shape our map, but still, however we shape it, there will still be some curvature that is not represented on our two-dimensional object here. That's why we're talking about projections, because we imagine a flat surface that covers the Earth or an um, object that can be flattened really and then we imagine that there is uh, probably a lamp in the center of the earth that sheds light on this flat object and by that casts shadow where our actually objects are on this this round um, sphere and uh, if we then roll this sheet of paper out we get different um, different ways of how this can be represented in two dimensions but as you can see here from the different ways um, they all make have to make some um, um, compromises in respect what is represented better what is represented worse if we have this uh, cylinder for example things that are near to the equator are well represented so you can see here we have uh, this grids here form um, which are all the same uh, distances or are squared are square they form actually also square in the flat representation but the further we get to the pole the more elongated these features will be if we have a cone then probably things here in the middle of the um, um, hemisphere is represented quite well while things on the equator and things on the pole are represented not ideally. If we want to have uh, the pole well represented we can use this flat polar um, representation but then the further we get to the equator the more compromises we have to make here. So there's no perfect coordinate system, no perfect uh, projection for all purposes in all areas of the world and that's why there are a lot of different uh, projection systems that can be used in respect to the data. What makes it even more? So every projection distorts some parts of your map, that's the takeaway message here. Um, if we have uh, this globular or orthographic projection there will be some distortion and uh, also in the Mikata projection that we'll see later there are some distortions of the objects. Um, projection matters in respect of the size that um, are um, of the objects that we see. Again it's another representation of this problem. These circles have all the same extent in the real world on a, on a sphere but when we make a projection here the objects on the poles are much larger than the objects on the equator. If we choose this kind of projection um, this the area of the different objects probably are more or less the same but you can see other distortions come here into place so at the uh, center of the hemis of one of the hemispheres the objects are probably roundish but the farther we get to the east and to the west uh, they become distorted and also here at the equator these things become elongated the, the, the circle so in this case in that case here we don't have a truth representation of the length uh, while the um, but we have a true a representation of the angles of the different uh, objects in the individual parts here 
while here we have probably the size is represented uh, correctly but now the angles are distorted that are probably linear features uh, here in the individual working areas that we can have here and also if we have this kind of uh, um, more sophisticated projection uh, still we get large distortions when we get to the edges of the map here so there is no perfect way of doing that and this really results in different representation of the same geographic feature and um, here you can see the uh, projection of the uh, American the, the, the um, USA and you can see that the these different projections results in very different images of the United States. The larger the area is, the more um, distortion you will have. So there are always different uh, compromises. One of um, the very common general projection is the Mercator projection, which is uh, makes the geometries at the poles look bigger than the geometries near the equator. But since most of the interesting area uh, are in the middle um, here of, of um, near the equator or a bit to the north and to the south. This is usually uh, a compromise that people take, for example, when it uh, is about mapping the whole world in one go. There's another um, map projection that is um, or coordinate system that's the universal transverse Mercator that is basically the same as a Mercator projection but this time um, uh, there are individual um, slides of the Earth's surface here and for all of them we have individual coordinates uh, meter based so with that at least when we are within one slide here uh, we have a rather decent representation um, so for each um, yeah, slide of the world there is a specific coordinate system that starts with um, a zero point somewhere within this slide here but the zero point is actually a bit outside we have false easting which means uh, we start with a higher number than zero at the edge here and then um, to avoid the possibility that if we go over the actual um, measured or the actual stri stripe here uh, that we do not get negative coordinates so the actual zero for this stripe for example might be somewhere here I don't remember the actual uh, value uh, on the spot and there is a um, y0 set at the south pole or the equator and this depends on if we're talking about the northern or the southern hemisphere so for the southern hemisphere the zero in y coordinates are set to the equator uh, to the south pole while for the northern hemisphere it's set to the equator and if we zoom in further to individual countries we can have also um, national coordinate system for example like the Schwe Schweizer Landeskoordinaten where we have a geographic coordinate system that's uh, specific to Switzerland it uses a map projection uh, as which is called oblique Mercator and it works on something that's called a bezel ellipsoid we will see later on why we have these different ellipsoids that are essentially descriptions of the Earth's surface as um, uh, three-dimensional object here and also here we have uh, false northing and false easting the center of this map coordinate system is set at Bern but uh, Bern is not set to be zero zero but uh, 200,000 meters in respect of the Y coordinate and 600,000 meters in respect of the X coordinate easting and northing and with that we avoid the, that we have negative coordinates also in this case so this is false easting false um, northing for example um, that we get uh, not zero coordinates within the working area that we are talking about why we have now these ellipsoids the problem is that the earth is actually not a perfect sphere but it's more or less a potato with different higher or lower uh, elevations it's also flatted in respect to the poles 
and this is of course uh, um, exaggerated um, but essentially these kind of structures we will have and if we have an ellipsoid that's perfect for the whole world for example like this blue one it's a kind of geometric representation of this flatted shape here but since the earth's surface is different in different parts of the world this will fit in different parts of the world better or worse it's the best compromise probably for representing the whole world and this ellipsoid is for example called WGS84 and that's used for latitude and longitude coordinates but also for the universal transverse Mercator coordinates um, because these are coordinate systems that are uh, representative for the whole world while if we have a more specific coordinate system for example here that is only valid for a specific part of the earth there might be a better way of describing the shape of the the earth especially in this area here while in other areas this description of the potato might be totally wrong but for the part that we're interested in that might be the more precise representation so that's why um, for different parts of the world we can have different ellipsoids like for example the Basel ellipsoid here for the Schweizer Landeskoordinaten. Okay so we have projection systems and we have ellipsoids and sometimes these and together they make coordinate reference systems but sometimes these terms are mixed up because for example if we talk about the latitude longitude coordinate system most of the time we just name that WGS84 because this implies that we have this kind of uh, system while if we talk about universal transverse Mercator we most of the time talk about UTM so in that case uh, we referring to the same ellipsoid but we uh, name this according to the actual coordinate reference system and in that case here with the Schweizer Landeskoordinaten we call it like that we talk about the coordinate system and the ellipsoid is meant by that that is specific to this. So a huge um, mess in respect of the naming and uh, we are not the only one that were annoyed by that uh, especially the European Petrol Survey Group Geodesy um, that was um, a group that formed by the petrol industry which is all over the world um, active in mapping uh, oil supplies for example they were also annoyed by this multitude of different coordinate and reference systems and so they introduced uh, a catalog um, which is named EPSG and this catalog has unique identifiers for all the coordinate reference systems of, of the world and there are thousands of them um, so you cannot remember all of them and if you do specific mapping in a specific area you probably should get an idea ask uh, before in what kind of coordinate system the uh, coordinates come to you and uh, you will get an EPSG number and then you can use that in, a G in your GIS to specify what the coordinate systems should be to translate the coordinates that you get into locations in on a map you it's probably worth to learn a few this WGS 84 which is latitude longitude is referenced as EPSG 4326 um, Google Maps and other online sources often use also WGS as an ellipsoid but they use a uh, pseudo Mercator projection and this is uh, 3857 so the coordinates that you get from Google if you use Google Maps for georeferencing for example might be a bit different than the coordinates that you get if you uh, are in, in an actual um, latitude longitude coordinate system and this can cause especially if you zoom in very close this can cause some some problems or errors in your representation so whenever you get coordinates from, from these online sources you might be uh, need to use this EPSG code for your actual map and the uh, current Swiss um, Landeskoordinaten are EPSG 2056 if you remember these three numbers you have already um, qu 
quite a good um, knowledge to start with and whatever is not in your memory you can always look that up for example in the JS system if you know what kind of keywords you need to use to search for these information so you will find that using uh, the search terms and then the JS will give you the EPSG code and with that the projection and the coordinate reference system here in the JS it's called CRS so coordinate reference system that means the ellipsoid together with the coordinate system that is used there okay don't be scared um, it is annoying sometimes to to work with these different things uh, in respect of the coordinates but once you're set and you know what kind of coordinate system your coordinates come from you um, for a specific map uh, the rest is straightforward in the end you have to set this once for your map and then you're good to go and you have to also set that for example if you import uh, a data set with a different coordinate system you have to specify that and then you can work with all of these different uh, coordinate systems projected in the correct way on top of each other using the JS that's one of the other benefits that we have with the JS that this takes this uh, burden away from you now for the first part of our practical part we will have to have our sites georeferenced so that we know where on the earth the individual sites are we will have you will have uh, different maps from the publications most of the time you do not know where the specific coordinates are and what uh, coordinate reference system were used in these individual maps so we will have basically just these images of the map and you have to um, trans transfer this map onto a geographic projected system and this can result in some distortion of the before rectangular map in the different coordinate system that you are using uh, this is not a problem because you can always then extract the information in the coordinate system that you would like to use for mapping um, but yeah this is a process to transfer or connect points in your map with the coordinates with specific coordinates and by that orienting this image here in real geographic space so every map comes with its own projection sometimes known most often not every map uh, results in has errors or imprecisions when you do a digitizing of an already printed map you will add some errors and that is annoying so most of the time it's better to use with already digitized data but in archaeology um, these site plans you probably will not have the access to the original uh, GIS in which they are produced so you have to digitize these maps and um, if you want to georeference a map scale map matters because uh, um, if you digitize information on a large scale that might be precise enough but on a small scale if you zoom in then probably not so you uh, have to have a good idea uh, what the extent of your original map is and what you in the end would like to present here to choose the correct way uh, how you georeference that how this is done in practice how you can connect individual points on such an image with coordinates from another source and then transform the image into a geographic representation you will see in the practical video and in the end you will have a georeferenced object where every pixel here has a um, coordinate value that you can extract um, and more n um, necessary probably if you have individual objects on detailed maps you can digitize them so make a feature a vector feature on from the originally printed uh, extent of these individual objects by for example clicking at them and giving them some information and uh, then the JS will take the coordinates that you clicked attach that to the other information that you have and then you can use these objects that are now digitized for producing your own map or uh, representing these objects in space or doing 
some other analyzes with them just from the printed map over the process of georeferencing to a digitized map that can be used in a JS to its full extent. So the process of attaching geo coordinates to points on the georeferenced maps is quite straightforward. You have to have a layer with a, a predefined geometry, so this georeferenced map. You make a new <coughs> uh, um, vector layer, uh, you make that editable, you click on the scanned map where you have your individual features, you probably add the additional information. You do that as long as you have objects here on your um, scanned map that needs to be digitized and finally you save the layer. Also this process will be shown to you in a practical video and we will do that together in the practical part of the session um, to come up with some georeferenced maps. Still, please watch both videos, the video for georeferencing and the video for digitizing and then we can start immediately with uh, your problems, questions and errors for your specific projects there and at, as a result of this um, two hours you will have your first um, map, self-made map of your site and then you can for the next session for example do some geostatistics on this map or represent some additional information that are connected for example to your different features um, from your database. Okay, that should be enough. It's always fun to talk about the different projection systems and uh, it's a necessary part, so you probably have digested already quite a lot of information here. Again, if you have some questions, uh, please contact me. You'll find the course material on our website. This time I used different, um, different sources for uh, different of the images so these are given here and I will see you then in the practical part where we can apply the things that you have seen in this video and also in the practical videos.